Andrews. Like, so those are things. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the um, Eileen Dondero Foley City Council Chambers for this evening's uh, presentations and public hearing. We're calling the meeting to order at this time, and I'd like to ask the city clerk to call the roll. Mayor Farini. Here. Assistant Mayor Blaylock. Here. Councilor Novelin Clayburg. Councilor DeWire. Here. Councilor Smith. Here. Councilor Kennedy. Here. Councilor Spear. Here. Councilor Reynolds. Here. Councilor Panalakis. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a public hearing regarding the July 1st, 2008 through June 30, 2009 budget. I will read the legal notices I am required to do. Uh, notice is hereby given that a public hearing will be held by the Portsmouth City Council on Wednesday, April 16, 2008 at 7 o'clock p.m. Eileen Dondero Foley City Council Chambers, Municipal Complex 1, Junkins Avenue, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. On the proposed FY July 1, 2008 through June 30, 2009 budget, the complete budget will be available for review in the Office of the City Clerk and Portsmouth Library during regular business hours beginning on Monday. April 14, 2008. And at this time, I'm going to recognize the city manager who is going to kick off the uh, de departmental presentations. John. Uh, thank you, Your Honor, and good evening. Uh, I just want to make sure that everybody has a copy of our, our handouts that we have. Those are going to be the charts that we'll be referring to on the screen. If you don't have a copy, just raise your hand and either Andrew or Gail will get you a copy. Tonight's public hearing on the proposed fiscal year 2009 budget covers expenditures for all city services, including schools, police, fire, recreation, library, public works, and other municipal departments for the period of July 1, 2008 through June 30, 2009. In accordance with Article 7 of the City Charter, I formally submitted this budget to the City Council on April 11. Over the last few years, together with the City Council, department heads, public input, and guidelines recommended by the Government Finance Officers Association, we have created a more comprehensive budget document to assist residents, business owners, and elected officials to better understand the budget and the budget process. As a result, the City of Portsmouth has received the Distinguished Budget Award from GFOA for two consecutive years. The City of Portsmouth is the first New Hampshire municipality to receive this prestigious award, which is the highest form of recognition in governmental budgeting. Copies of the Fiscal 09 budget are located at the Public Library, the City Clerk's Office, and on the City's website for your viewing. Tonight's public hearing will include presentations from the School Department, Police Chief, and Fire Chief regarding the proposed FY09 budgets. After the presentations, the Mayor will open the public hearing for comments and or questions from the public. After the public hearing has been completed, there will be an opportunity to comment and the Mayor and City Council will adjourn the public hearing till May 12th. Over the next couple of weeks, the City Council will conduct work sessions with the police, fire, school, and municipal departments. On May 12th, the public hearing will reopen to allow taxpayers additional feedback once the Council has uh, had more uh, in-depth uh, budget discussions with various departments. Although municipalities nationwide are struggling in these difficult financial times, the City of Portsmouth has positioned itself to weather a lean economy. We've accomplished this by implementing financial policies over the past 10 years to improve our fiscal stability, address long-term liabilities, and limit the impact from external financial conditions. These include, but are not limited to, the creation of a fund balance ordinance, a leave it termination fund, a health insurance stabilization fund, capital improvement plan, and a rolling stock replacement program. As a result of these many efforts, the city has a double-A bond rating, the highest rating it's had in its history. Not only does this result in substantial savings to our taxpayers in the form of reduced borrowing costs annually, the city also avoids the requirement to obtain bond insurance that faces many other communities. The city of Portsmouth has achieved uh, many accomplishments and has much to be proud of. I would like to address just a few of our major, major accomplishments for fiscal 08. Our public library became the first municipal building in New Hampshire to receive LEED or Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design certification as part of the city's continuing sustainable efforts. We've initiated the design and replacement of our outdated fire station 2 to be relocated to a new site on Lafayette Road. We have increased citizen participation through study circles to examine citywide issues such as the renovation of the middle school and sustainability efforts. 
We've selected a design engineer for the upgrade to the 50-year-old Madbury water treatment plant. And we've entered into an agreement that will lead to the redevelopment of Lafayette School into senior housing. <coughs> we also have several other important projects on the way, many of them substantially funded by state and federal dollars that will be leveraged with city funds in the FY09 capital budget. Now I'd like to talk specifically about the proposed fiscal 2009 budget. That I, I, I submitted to the city council uh, the budget as requested by the school board, police, fire commissions, and municipal departments. The proposed fiscal year 2009 general fund budget is $83.1 million, or 4.1% increase over fiscal 08. The FY09 budget reflects certain expectations regarding the level of services that the citizens of Portsmouth have come to expect. It is our goal to provide these services in a comprehensive and cost-effective manner. As you can see on chart number six, the total budget is comprised of the operating budget of $67.3 million, or 81% of the total budget, and the non-operating budget of $15.8 million, which represents 19% of the total budget. As you can see from chart number seven, the non-operating budget of $15.8 million includes expenditures for debt service, overlay, capital outlay, county tax, contingency, tax anticipation notes, and other non-operating costs. It, re it represents a 2.8% increase over the fiscal 08 budget. The operating budget of $67.3 million funds expenditures associated with the day-to-day -day operation and services provided by the city's various departments. As this pie graph illustrates, the municipal portion of the operating budget represents approximately 23% of the operating budget, the police department makes up 13%, the fire department comprises of 10%, and the school department represents approximately 52% of the proposed operating budget. I'll address the portion labeled collective bargaining contingency later on in the presentation. There are many challenges in this, uh, this year which affected the FY09 budget. The major factors are personnel costs such as salaries, retirement, health insurance and workers' compensation, operating costs such as contracted services, utilities and repairs, and maintenance, and non-operating expenses su expenditures such as capital outlay, county tax, and debt service. By far the largest increase in the proposed general fund budget represents costs associated with personnel. This is not surprising <laughs> as city services are labor intensive. As you can see from the pie chart, Personnel costs make up 82% of the operating budget. This leaves only 18% of the operating budget to fund expenditures associated with utilities, contracted services, repairs and maintenance, tuition and pupil transportation. Salaries and personnel costs are established by the city's 15 collective bargaining agreements for employing our teachers, firefighters, police officers, and other municipal staff. This year, we are faced with the reality that all 15 agreements will expire on June 30th, 2008. Therefore, I've asked each department <clears throat> to prepare its budget without any wage adjustments other than step increases for those employees who are eligible and have not reached top step. The number of employees who receive step increases represents 30% of the staff in the municipal departments, 31% in the police department, 34% in the fire department, and 42% in the school department. In the next several months, the city will be negotiating with each bargaining unit, but it's unpredictable at this time when settlements will be reached. <clears throat> it is important to note that when considering wage adjustments, every 1% increase for each department represents approximately $82,000 for municipal, $65,000 for police, $44,000 for fire, and $222,000 for the school department. Therefore, every 1% salary adjustment increase for all city departments will equate to approximately $413,000. As it is unknown what the potential negotiated impact associated with salaries and benefits would be for each department, I'm recommending appropriating $1 million in a separate line item within the operating budget that would reserve funds until such time as contracts are settled. Therefore, the proposed operating budget of $67.3 million includes $1 million for collective bargaining contingency. Another factor affecting the budget is the New Hampshire retirement system contribution rates for all city full-time employees. Although the rates will remain the same as last year, this is an area that may have major impact depending on future legislation. 
In fiscal 09, the additional cost for retirement budgeted within each department totals $50,000. This increase does not include retirement impact associated with salary adjustments, which have not yet been negotiated. For FY09, the health trust, our, our medical health insurance provider, has provided the city with a health insurance guaranteed maximum rate of 7.5% increase. As you can see from this chart, health insurance rates increase or decrease dramatically from year to year. The total premium for fiscal 09 is projected to be approximately $11 million. The city employees' share will be approximately $1.9 million, or 18% of the total cost, leaving the city's share to be $9 million. As everyone is aware, health insurance costs continue to grow. However, the City of Portsmouth has been able to stabilize this increase for each department through the implementation of the Health Insurance Stabilization Fund established in fiscal year 2002. For each fiscal year, the Health Insurance Stabilization Fund policy established the amount to appropriate for health insurance by using the past 10-year average rate change in cost for insurance and applied that percentage amount to the department's prior year budget. Any shortfall in one department was funded by the Health Insurance Reserve. While the Health Insurance Stabilization Fund accomplished its goal of stabilizing increase to health insurance appropriations for each department in prior years, the city recalibrated the appropriation for each department in fiscal 09. Changes such as employment, employee status change, and state legislation over the last seven years have made this recalibration necessary. The recalibration requires that each department appropriate their estimated actual costs for their employee needs. As a result, the city was able to reduce its overall budget for health insurance in FY09 by $127,000. The fire department will have the greatest impact with a $96,000 increase, while the school department will see a $228,000 reduction in health insurance appropriation. In another area, more than 12 years ago, the city was facing a growing liability associated with sick leave pay owed to employees upon termination. Two methods were established to eliminate future liabilities and stabilize the existing liability from year to year. The first was to negotiate with all bargaining units the elimination of a sick leave payout for any new employee hired after 1996, which has saved millions of dollars that would have had to have been spent in future years. The second was the creation of a leave termination stabilization fund in fiscal 99. This fund was established to eliminate annual budget spikes, which negatively impacted the operating budget. Each department appropriates a fixed amount annually, as established by an actuarial study, which funds these payouts until the elimination of the liability. It's important to note that 60% of our current employees were hired after 1996 and are not eligible to receive sick leave payout upon termination. In fiscal 08, the city reviewed the liability and adjusted the annual appropriations for the municipal and police departments, leaving the school department to be adjusted in fiscal 09. As such, the overall termination, leave of termination appropriation for fiscal 09 budget has increased by $300,000 for the school department. Although the school department will need to increase the appropriation for the leave of termination by $300,000, we're able to reduce the health insurance appropriation for the school department by $228,000, leaving a net increase of $71,000. The city is not alone in having its budget impacted by the high cost of electricity, gasoline and diesel, natural gas and heating oil. Although the proposed budget amount of $2.4 million reflects a slight decrease over our FY08 energy budget, we must remember that utility costs have inflated over our, our budget by about 36% from just three years ago as depicted in this chart. In fiscal 08, the city maintained utility costs for both the old and new public library. Therefore, the slight decrease of $42,000 for utility costs in FY09 is partially related to the elimination of the cost of utilities for the old library. In order to stabilize the utility costs in hopes of reducing them, the city took an initial step in fiscal 06 by examining its history of energy consumption. It was determined that overall the city's energy use had remained consistent from year to year with some fluctuations caused by extreme weather conditions. Over the last couple of years, the City Council has taken additional steps by appointing a seven-member committee on sustainable practices to work with city staff, local officials, and the community to identify initiatives to reduce both the cost and consumption of energy and other resources. K-12 
capital. <laughs> and each year, the planning board recommends annual appropriations of $1 million to $1.5 million from the general fund for capital projects with the uh, capital improvement plan. This year, the planning board identified projects totaling $1.4 million. At a meeting on March 18th, the city council reduced the planning board's recommendation to $1.3 million, which is proposed in this year's budget. Including the FY09 budget, the average expenditure for capital outlay over an eight-year period is approximately $1 million a year. Now, at this time, what I'd like to do is ask that the chair of the um, school board come forward, Mitch Schuldman, to work with Dr. Lister on the school department's presentation. Uh, we'll have the police chief and the <laughs> fire chief. And once that's done, I'm going to come back for only a few, couple minutes to talk about the revenue side of the budget. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to, uh, uh, to Mitch Schuldman. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, City Council. Um, in Portsmouth, we have set a tall order for ourselves, which is to educate all students by challenging them to become thinking, responsible, contributing citizens who continue to learn throughout their lives. And we do educate all students because Portsmouth has a fully inclusive philosophy that looks at students from pre-K through age 21. And we do challenge them through our curriculum. As we went through the budget process this year and engaged with the budget makers, a handful of themes came up in every conversation regardless of grade level, which became the basic principles that guided us in our conversation and decisions. In Portsmouth, we strive towards a personalized education for every child. By this, we mean that teachers are given ample opportunities to get to know each individual child, to know their strengths and their weaknesses, and to use their best judgment as they assess their students' progress. And one of the best ways to ensure that this student-teacher relationship develops is to keep class sizes reasonable, giving teachers the opportunity to get to know each child. And it is important that we focus our resources on core academic subjects, such as math and English and the foreign languages. Whether we agree with them or not, all schools must respond to both federal and state mandates, funded and unfunded. Whether it's No Child Left Behind or New Hampshire's own Follow the Child, all of these mandates play a prominent role in how our educators and administrators approach their everyday job. And lastly, we recognize the importance of ensuring that our students develop a strong understanding of technology in order to be able to make sense of the overload of information they take in all day, every day. And most importantly, that they are able to learn and use new technologies, technologies that haven't been invented for jobs and careers that don't exist yet. And we use a variety of measurements to assess how well we're doing. We have consistently made gains in our NECAP test scores, and this year the state has established baselines against uh, which to judge future 11th grade students. And while it is important to acknowledge that there's always room for improvement, uh, Portsmouth students consistently perform better than state averages in almost all areas and almost all grades. Our dropout rate, as calculated by the state definition, is the lowest it has been in 17 years. And yet, as wonderful as that sounds, we still lost 19 students this year. The board is proud of the work that our educators are doing, and we realize that it is, it, it is in all of our best interest to do all we can to help our students make the right choices, offer them different ways to stay in school, like the PASS program, and help them to graduate with a high school diploma. Our educators have spent many hours this year developing common expectations for students at each grade level in the area of reading. These expectations, which we call the power standards, focus instruction and, and assessment on a core set of competencies that we expect every student to know and to be able to do. And also, teachers are working together to develop local grade level benchmark assessments. And under the leadership of our administrative team, Teachers are working across buildings and across grade levels, discussing and, in share, and sharing instructional methods and strategies with their peers at a level never seen before. The future looks bright for education in Portsmouth. We have identified some specific challenges that the board feels the district must address, some of which we have identified but are not addressed in this budget, but will be in future years. 
The size of critical core courses at the high school have reached unsustainable levels. 30% uh, of upper level math classes at the high school are nearing 30 students per class. And the Little Harbor population is growing. The fifth grade next year will see a bubble of 77 students, which is going to require a new teacher in order to maintain reasonable class sizes. And at the same time, the earlier grades have bubbles that are starting to move through the system. Little Harbor first grade this year, uh, next year has um, 80 students. Getting a handle on how we pay for special education services we offer is also a serious concern and something we all need to better understand. And the school board and the school department hopes to address this this year with the formation of a special ed task force. Another state requirement is that we begin to offer business classes at the high school. Recently, the district has cobbled together a business class drawing on the volunteer spirit of many of our local business people. However, the board feels that it is time to move beyond this and to fund a position. And again, technology rises to the top. Not only is the district in dire straits when it comes to adequately funding technology, that is purchasing enough computers for teachers and student labs, ensuring that there are enough LCD projectors and smart boards for uses in the classroom, but at the same time, there must be adequate technical support on the IT side and teacher support on the academic instructional side. The dilemma of how to fund technology will not go away anytime soon. And lastly, a perennial issue you have heard us talk about before, something we have very little control over, but nonetheless has a very real impact on how we offer our instruction, student mobility which is the constant entering and leaving of students and their families from our community and our schools. The notion of reorganization is actually a yearly phenomenon in the life of a school district. Class sizes change from year to year. Bubbles travel through the system. There is a constant reassessment of which leak to plug up from year to year. Decisions are often made, for example, not to refill certain retirements but in our constant effort to reorganize based on always changing needs, that money is often used in other ways and for other purposes that the district believes are necessary, uh, details of which we will discuss in our work session. And the growth of the number of students coded with autism spectrum disorder is a national issue that is reflected here in Portsmouth, requiring that we address this with an additional teacher. The district has been exploring creative solutions to collaborate and share personnel and costs with other city departments where it makes sense. These are just a few examples of what we have done in the past years. And the Special Ed Task Force I mentioned in the last slide is an example of our reaching out for cooperation throughout the city to help us all better understand and communicate issues and concerns surrounding special education. The school department has addressed a number of identified needs in the past through restructuring and reorganizing retirements and other resources. However, the board believes that there are specific needs we must address directly through the request for additional resources. We are requesting a modest amount of money to replace computers for teachers and labs. In all honesty, this is a small percentage of the money that must be invested if we are to realize the vision of technology being a core academic tool in our district, a vision that requires money for hardware, money for software, and money for both personnel, instructional, and IT support. This year, we are beginning to address, address this at the elementary level with a new position that will support the technology needs of our elementary school teachers. We're addressing the growing population at the Little Harbor Elementary School and the business position at the high school. One of the strongest concerns expressed by the elementary principals this year was the unintended consequence of the decision not to refill 10 paraprofessional positions. In the past, the paraprofessionals have been able to help provide a safety net of instruction for students who, for whatever reason during the course of the year, begin to fall behind their peers in certain areas and skills. The paras have been there to work with these students as these deficiencies become apparent, boosting them up so they won't fall further behind and perhaps have to be coded for an IEP later in their school career. And lastly, historically, Portsmouth has funded much of its SPED program through incoming tuition as other districts sent their children to us because of the quality services that Portsmouth offered. In years past, the SPED program was not only self-sufficient but actually revenue generating. 
But those days are over as districts are finding it more cost effective to create their own in-house special ed programs and services. And as a consequence, Portsmouth must restructure how we fund special ed in a way that fully funds our own students with money budgeted into the general fund. Last year, the city auditor ordered the school department to pay off its outstanding debt, which we did through sacrifice, a warm winter, and a budget freeze. Last year, the board voted to place an extra $100,000 into this year's general fund to cover some spikes. This year, we realized that this is just not enough money, and we have raised that $100,000 to $400,000 and hope that this will be sufficient. Dr. Lister. Thank you, Dr. Schuldman. Um, the last slide that we'd like to show you is the budget request that we have. Uh, just the budget broken down into different categories. Again, as Mr. Bohanko said before, 82% of the, the budget is salaries and benefits, and that's very true for the school department as well. Uh, the other areas, services, supplies, equipment, and other. And the percentage increase we're requesting this year is 2.5%. And I would just like to end our presentation by thanking all of our budget makers um, and the leadership team for putting these, this budget request together. We're looking forward to our work session with the city council. Um, and at this time, I'd like to introduce the police chief, Michael Magnet. Mayor Brady, city councilors. City Manager, Citizens of Portsmouth. Good evening and thank you for this opportunity to talk about your police department. Overall, we handled over 38,000 calls for service. Our felonies are up 8%, fraud-related crime is up significantly, and we had three drug-related overdose deaths last year. We made approximately 1,600 arrests. 37% of them were alcohol-related. Let me say that again, 37% or 590 of the arrests that we made last year were alcohol related. This year we established drug-free zones around public housing in partnership with the Portsmouth Housing Authority. This initiative is similar to the drug-free zones around public schools in that it carries enhanced penalties for violations. Excessive speed remains the number one concern of residents. We deploy a number of resources and initiatives to deal with this issue, including a Stelstat, which allows covert capture analysis of speed data, a portable message sign that monitors and displays speed to increase driver awareness, a strategic traffic enforcement program, which is a grant-funded program through New Hampshire Highway Safety Agency, which helps to fund speed, seatbelt, and DWI initiatives, we work in partnership with a number of city agencies and committees, including traffic and safety, to identify dangerous intersections and problematic locations. Through these joint efforts, along with our everyday traffic enforcement, I'm pleased to report that over the last five years, property damage accidents are down 22%, and personal injury accidents are down 23%. Talk a little bit about some of our challenges. Managing growth. We're always trying to balance ongoing growth while being fiscally responsible to Portsmouth taxpayers. As the headline reads, Portsmouth has become a mini Boston on a small slice of coast. <coughs> Portsmouth is acquiring more and more urban characteristics and the issues that go along with them. Pease continues to see extensive growth. Fifteen years after the base closure, the trade port, which covers both Pease Air National Guard and the trade port properties, has emerged as the number one base realignment success story in the nation. The Pease Business Park has nearly 7,000 employees from 220 companies. Homeland Security. September 11th has expanded our mission in policing and we continue to live in its shadow. Intelligence sources advise us on a daily basis that we must remain vigilant in protecting our community. Portsmouth remains an event mecca. We host a diverse number of events all year round, which draws hundreds of thousands of people each year. In 2007, there were 194 special events held here in Portsmouth. Sometimes there are as many as five events running at the same time in the city. 
We are prepared as a police department for catastrophic events such as the floods that occurred last April. During that time, we received 2,000 phone calls. Security details. We are responsible for handling the coordination of political candidate visits. In 2007, we had 26 visits by presidential candidates. The number of people who attend these events, as well as the number of events themselves, make it very difficult to police. We continue to face the challenge of cybercrime. Identity theft remains the number one form of cybercrime in the country. And our own statistics reflect these trends. Cybercrime in Portsmouth is up 20% over 2006, and we expect this trend to continue. Sex offenders. We're vigilant in monitoring sex offenders who are required by law to register with us. The research is very clear. The recidivism rate of sex offenders is high, and we are attentive about keeping tabs on each and every one throughout the year. Last year, our detectives made 10 arrests of offenders for statutory violations. Underage drinking. We responded to 19 underage drinking parties in 2007 and arrested 100 young adults as a result of those parties. We continue to struggle to find ways to deal with the mentally ill and addicted who are chronically homeless. The sad reality is that law enforcement and the criminal justice system have become the caretakers of last resort for this population, and that's not going to change anytime soon. We coordinate our efforts with many other social service agencies to provide services and placement and shelters for the homeless, but for some, this has become a lifestyle of choice drugs and narcotics. We continue to be challenged by the influx of heroin into our city limits. Last year, the city had three overdose <coughs> or drug-related deaths from opiates, methadone, and heroin. We made 74 arrests for possessions of drugs and 15 arrests for drug dealing. Over the year, we removed marijuana, cocaine, crack cocaine, meth, heroin, and illegal prescription drugs from our streets and we successfully investigated prostitution and gambling operations as well. A little bit about our Bureau of Investigative Services. It's made up of several divisions, our general investigators who are responsible for investigating serious crime. We're talking about suspicious deaths, burglaries, armed robberies. Our Family Services Division, which is responsible for juvenile crime, child abuse investigation, child neglect investigation, our school resource officers. Our Special Investigation Unit, which is responsible for investigating drugs, gambling, and prostitution. And then our Internet Crimes Against Children. As you know, the Internet has opened up a whole new universe for offenders to prey on our children. The Bureau of Investigative Services consists of 15 sworn officers, and approximately three of these officers are either grant-funded or funded through other external sources. In 2007, we executed over 100 search warrants, and made 129 felony arrests. Our budget. The police department is proposing an $8.68 million budget, which as you can see represents a 4% increase over the current budget. Approximately 52% of the increase is attributable to salaries and benefits. This includes contractual obligations and monies to replace the loss in street sweeper funding used for drug, prostitution, and gambling investigations. It also covers dental and workers' compensation premium increases and funding for an 11th dispatcher position. In 2001, the City of Portsmouth hired a consultant to study our emergency dispatch operations. One of the primary recommendations was to increase our staffing. This year, we've had major staffing shortages, resulting in almost 400 extended shifts of forced overtime. Our dispatches are tired and they need relief. 20% of the increase is for overtime, which again includes investigative costs that were funded by the Street Sweeper program. It also includes funds for computer forensic examinations and investigations and projected patrol coverage. The remaining 28% of the increase includes small cost adjustments, plus the addition of a new service agreement for our battery backup for our dispatch center. Also included are increases for ammunition, the purchase of bulletproof vests and other equipment, plus tuition and travel costs for training. Lastly, projected increases in vehicle and equipment repair, gasoline, and professional services used in our hiring and promotion processes are included. 
As you can see, overall, 87% of our proposed budget resources are allocated to salaries and benefits, 6% for overtime and 7% for other operating. The demands on the police department are unique in that it is a 24-7 manpower intensive <laughs> enterprise. We maintain constant vigilance to keep the city safe. We do not just respond to calls for service. Our officers are out on your streets every hour of the day and night as a high visibility deterrent safeguarding your home, your businesses, and your family. In giving you the snapshot of your police department, it's with great pride that I close by mentioning that several of our officers were recipients of the 2007 Red Cross Hero Awards as a result of suicide by cop calls. These suicide by cop calls are a chief's nightmare as they involve individuals who are mentally ill and highly unpredictable. But these officers handle themselves with tremendous restraint and poise because they are well trained, they are well equipped, they have the information they need at their fingertips, and most importantly, they are professionals. That is what your tax dollars pay for, and that is why I ask for your continued support for the police department's budget. Councils, I just want to add that the commission looks forward to meeting with you tomorrow night to discuss our budget. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Fire Chief Chris LeClaire. <coughs> Good evening, um, Mayor, City Council. Uh, I'd like to uh, present this uh, fiscal year 2009 Fire Department presentation. Um, just to give you a snapshot of the Fire Department, it's 62 full-time employees, um, 14 personnel assigned per shift out of three stations that operate 24 hours a day. Answering a total of around 5,000 emergency responses for all types of fires, EMS requests, hazardous materials response, and emergency management issues. Our call volume is uh, broke up about 50-50 between fire responses and EMS issues. Our fire activity, uh, as you see, the majority of our work load is due with rescues, emergency transports. Uh, it could be uh, EMS calls, motor vehicle accidents, technical or industrial rescues, and marine emergencies. Our fire activity, um, you can see the various other fire structure fires, uh, hazardous meals conditions, as an at calls, and so on. EMS patient conditions, 62% um, of the patient's contacts that we have are potentially unstable, and that includes calls such as chest pains, cardiac conditions, medical uh, emergencies, and traumatic injuries. Out of all the patient transports or contacts that we have, 83% um, are transported to local area hospitals. As you know, two of the city's three ambulances are staffed. Uh, one is uh, uh, put on the road when needed, uh, taking a fire apparatus out of service, but together they generate about half a million dollars annually in revenue. They're utilizing 17 paramedics, one of those uh, being the assistant chief in charge of training, and uh, most of the staff is a minimum qualification of an EMT intermediate. Our fire prevention and inspection division, uh, extremely busy. Uh, due to uh, construction and constant renovations in the city and the various types of construction and occupancies that we have. 129 active places of assembly that need permits every year, plus additional permits for apartment buildings, elderly housing, manufacturing facilities, fuel storage depots, mass transit facilities, and churches. Fire prevention and inspection, 111 plans reviewed, 2,340 customer inquiries, a very busy division that now has two people in it. Our fiscal year 09 goals is to maintain a minimum shift staffing of 13. If you remember, the initial budget request of close to 9.7% over last year was including the 14th firefighter at night. This budget represents a reduction in personnel. Uh, we try to maintain a minimum staff of 13 day and night. What that does is reduce staffing at Station 2 from 4 to 3. Uh, it's important that we have the proper number of personnel to respond to emergencies in a timely and appropriate fashion. We're working on the construction of the new station in District 2. Site hazard assessments are ongoing on that piece of property. We continue our infrastructure improvements, such as the improvements to Station 1, which should start here in the spring. And to maintain a lead role in regional responses and special hazards and maritime operations, and the department will be participating in a United States Coast Guard federal drill in June 
involving all regional assets. We're working with our city council, the capital improvement plan to maintain a modern apparatus fleet. Uh, thanks to the city manager, the commission, the city council, we've done quite well. And we'll continue our efforts toward international accredited agency status. Now on to our budget. This budget represents a 5.51% increase over fiscal year 08, a down from the original request of 9.7, includes minimum staffing of 13 personnel per shift. The increase is due to step increases, health insurance recalculation, and increased retirement contributions. <laughs> In closing, I'd just like to thank my staff, uh, thank the fire commissioners, uh, the council and the city manager for all the support during the year. And I'll turn it at this time, turn it back over to the city manager. Thank you, Chief. Uh, as with any budget, uh, expenditures uh, equal revenues. And as you can see from chart 49, property taxes remain the city's major source of funding for services provided by the various departments as well as our share of the Rockingham County budget. The remaining 22% is revenue generated by the use of reserves for debt service, state revenues, school tuition, interest, parking, and other local sources. If adopted as proposed, the total FY09 budget would result in a tax rate of $17.22 per thousand of property value. This is an overall increase of 88 cents in the tax rate. As a general rule, for every one cent reduction in the tax rate is equal to approximately $37,500 reduction in either expenditures or an increase in revenues or a combination of both. The mayor and city council members have set a goal for the general fund expenditures not to increase by more than 3.5%. The submitted proposed budget of $83.1 million represents a 4.1% increase over fiscal year 08. To meet this goal, a reduction of approximately $514,000 would be needed to meet the council's target. This will require difficult policy decisions and choices in order to meet this goal. I believe that working together with the city council, the school board, commissioners, and department heads during the budget sessions over the next couple of weeks, we can achieve the city council's goal and continue to provide a high level of services and an acceptable tax rate for the citizens of Portsmouth. And at this time, I'd like to turn the uh, public hearing back to the mayor to open it up for uh, public comment. Your Honor. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, Dr. Lister, Dr. Schuldman, uh, Police Chief Magnet, Fire Chief LeClaire, the City Manager, the Boards and Commissions, and everybody who worked on these to get it to this point. Uh, now we engage in the public hearing. Again, for those present to remember that it is a two-step process that we will uh, that we will recess the meeting at the end of, of tonight's uh, proceedings and then we'll open it up again as we indicated on the schedule. And just to remind you uh, the ground rules that we follow, uh, typically we allow, though the rules do not require, people to speak three times. So what I would ask is first time speakers speak once uh, and when everyone has gone through, we will then, I will then call the second round and likewise with the third. Uh, additionally, the rules do allow the chair to um, limit the time of presentation uh, or, or someone's comments if need be. I would certainly be reluctant to do that. Uh, and under the circumstances, I would just ask that everyone keep in mind that the subject of tonight's discussion is the budget and that um, you keep your comments uh, as succinct as you can, understanding that some comments need to be more than just brief. Uh, and that uh, you, you think about your fellow presenters or people who are going to speak this evening. We in the City Council look forward to hearing from you. This is a great part of the process. I also direct you, uh, for those with uh, additional interest after tonight, to look to the three meetings we have planned, the work sessions where you'll be able to hear more. It will give you more information, and that's why we're going to have another public hearing at the end of the process. So with that, I'll call the first round for people who wish to speak um, uh, as regards the budget, ask you to come forward, identify yourself, give your name and address, and uh, please make your comments and they'll be most welcome. Thanks. Please come forward if you wish. 
nobody's that shy out there. I, I, I really do want to hear from you if you wish to comment. Um, so we have a taker. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Recker, 422 Banfield Road. I'm a homeowner. I'm a property owner. I'm also a business person. On public works, I would hope that perhaps maybe if you didn't spread as much salt on the streets in the wintertime, we might be able to save a little money. Also, if the plow trucks didn't keep going around and plowing dry roads on asphalt, perhaps we could save a little bit of money. Uh, in public works, Public Works, when they do a construction project for the city, which is us and all of us, they have to hire a police officer at right around 50 bucks an hour, $50 an hour. I would think that Public Works has personnel that could do this themselves and that perhaps we could save some money there. And I would hope that the police department does not take offense to me because of that, because I do have a lot of vehicles. Uh, public works again. <clears throat> we take a lot of brush to public works and we chew it up. And up until, I guess, just recently, you could go to public works and you could get this. It's not the greatest mulch in the world. <laughs> and I've never gotten any. I've taken brush from my properties, which is probably 20 acres or, mo or more. But today I had, I just, for some reason, I wanted to go there and get some mulch, and I was informed that I couldn't get any mulch because it's being sold to public service to be burned, which is okay if when we grind, when the city pays, we pay to have that brush all ground up. Okay, we have to pay for that. If we're getting money back in return for public service to offset that, that's fine with me. That's, that's, if the, that's if the paperwork shows that that's the way it is. Or perhaps we're making a little bit of money on it. That's fine. Also, the steel, I'd like to know if we're making money on all the steel that goes there. There's a lot of steel that's taken in there. You can take the steel to Wimpy Scrapyard or to Northwood and sell it and get some dollars for it. So I'd be curious to know if we are making a profit on that or we're making money or breaking even. I don't care if we're making money, if, as long as we're breaking even. Also, the paper and the cardboard. We should be breaking even on that. We used to have to pay to get rid of all this stuff. Now, some of you people are younger that haven't been around here when Public Works had to go around and pick all this junk up off the street for days and days and sometimes weeks at a time, and we had to pay to get rid of it. That's not happening anymore. Then also the cans and the bottles. Are we making a profit on that, or are we breaking even on that? I'd really like to know. I'd like some paperwork on that. I kind of like to know if all the department heads are accountable for the people that are underneath them. Then, in other words, myself, I'm a business person. And I have to go to work every day, and I come up with a little tally of what I've done for that day or for that week, and also at the end of the year. Now, I'm curious if that's what happens here. Because if that's so, perhaps we should be getting a little bit more out of our department heads. Maybe not. Maybe so. I'm wondering if there's a need for, well, some of the some of the, the the police chief, the fire chief, some of them have their own have city vehicles that they take home. All right. Now some of that I can see, but perhaps maybe, just maybe, at the price of gasoline and oil or diesel fuel, which we're all paying, perhaps they could pay their own fair share and put their own gas or their own diesel fuel and do their own maintenance on their own vehicles. I know what that costs. I've got 29 vehicles, and it's beginning to hurt. And it kind of bugs me. I own my own stuff, so I have a right to use my own vehicles. But I'm paying for it. 
But sometimes it kind of bugs me when I see city vehicles going home all the time, which they have a right to do, the way it's set up, to go home and back here. But I would believe that there should be some kind of a mechanism where they could pay for their own gas, their own diesel, their own maintenance, and maybe their own insurance, because that's not cheap either. I looked at that budget that you have for the library, and the budget that you got for the library is blowing my ever-loving mind. That's really up there. I realize that we all want a good police department. We all want a good fire department. We all want a good school department. Oh, we all want a good public works. We all want a good building right here in City Hall. We all want that. But sometimes, perhaps, that we might want more than we should have. There's times in my life that I wanted to buy a new piece of machinery, and I put it off. I'm curious, you, you nine persons up there, or 11 persons, actually, city attorney and city clerk, can you give us any ways? Can you, yourselves, you, that we can cut the costs in this city? You should be able, you, you, you people were elected. You should, each one of you should come up with a sheet and say, we can cut this, maybe we can do this, maybe we can do that. You should be doing that. The special events. I'm not quite sure. I know my wife used to be in a rec department, and we have a thing about this. Special events, do they pay for police safety? Or is it on us? Do we pay for that? Now, I'm kind of going to be a bad boy when I say something like that. But still, we're paying for it. Political people that come into this city, do we pay for that too? Or should they have to pay for that? I mean, they're getting contributions like all outdoors. I would think that there should be some kind of a mechanism that they should have to pay for all this, besides us paying for it. I'm curious, if you set a zero budget, Mr. Mayor and Mr. City Manager, if this city's going to fall apart, I don't think it's going to fall apart if you set a zero budget. I really don't. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, Mayor, City Councilors, Bill St. Laurent, 253 Colonial Drive. Uh, and I also represent the Taxpayers Association. Um, I'm glad to see that, which, that the departments are trying to work to cut their budgets down. But we're in a hard time right now. I mean, these budgets might have been good two years, a year or two ago but we're all suffering right now. Um, as a, for instance, there's been uh, 90 foreclosures in the Rockingham County in 2007, 2008, 190. So something's wrong here. Um, things are costing too much. Whether they, they are due to uh, taxes, who knows? It's probably a part of it. But I think this year we ought to go for a zero budget. I know it's, it's a tough thing, but we're in tough times. And we got a lot of people talking and saying they can't afford now because of the gasoline, because of the fuel. Um, not only do we pay for the extra fuel prices in our homes and our cars, but we pay for the city. So if we have to control our spending, that's where it has to come in the city. I've been reading article upon article, even my own uh, American Legion, the, the, uh, the end of it stating it's over government spending. We're the, you're the government. We're the government. The, the uh, article's from Dover. Uh, it's not the tax, it's the spending. Um, 
I know it's tough to cut spending. Um, there are various towns that are having problems. Some of them are even considering going to the town type of government, trying to get back to it so the people can decide and not just the body of people that they elect. Uh, we've got towns that are privatizing some of their parts of their city for departments. I don't want to see Portsmouth get like that. Um, and maybe because of this tough year, we could try for zero spending. Um, I'm not totally familiar with the budget. I haven't had time. It's only been out a short period of time um, to look through it. Um, but we'll be having our meeting next week, so we'll be deciding a little more then. So I'm basically generalizing here. Um, I was a little disappointed in your first meeting with all the departments uh, that they didn't let's get together and let's work on this budget this year. I didn't hear one department say we're going to work with the city council. We're going to try to get this uh, budget down as much as possible. Um, so you've got a tough job. You're going to be meeting them now in uh, work sessions. Um, a few of the things I, I, I don't know that possibly you could go over. Um, one of the ideas that uh, one of the articles that I read was that um, the percentage of policemen per 1,000 people is it's one one policeman for every thousand, and that's the general percentage. Portsmouth is three per 1,000. So they might say, "Well, we've got a big influx of people that come in." Okay, that's possible. Then maybe we should be looking for a way. Find out the people who are causing this to help contribute more and not bear it on the taxpayer. But three to one, we're the only one. Three to one, that's, that's pretty tough. Um, and we're bearing that responsibility. Um, and talking around to different people. Um, I guess what I'm saying is I don't see the departments. I, I don't think that they're working. To, they're, they're working what they had last year and not trying to look at ways to, to, to solve other problems this year. Um, one of the suggestions that was given me from another fire department was that instead of the, uh, the 13 that they have, that they go to a 24-48 shift, which is a one day on and two days off which has solved a lot of the problems in other fire departments because it's utilized more of the, fi the, the firemen that they have. So maybe that's something you could ask. Um, are we getting, are we going after the money that, for the ambulance service through insurances? I mean, there are many ways that we, we should be really trying to, to look for revenue here. Um, like I say, I'm just generalizing now because I'm not totally familiar with the budget, but please go and continue and if you can, try to get this down to a zero budget. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another speaker. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, <coughs> City Council. <coughs> My name is Eric Anderson, 38 George's Terrace, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, the presentation this evening was, I think, very respectable. Um, we do understand that the services that we have in the city are, are professional, and and um, just want to probably provide some some comments on them. Um, I think City Manager Bohanko in Chart Nine recognized, I think, the biggest task of what you have to look at, and that the major factors affecting the. F 09 budget, our personnel costs, but salaries and overtime. I don't know. Overtime, I think, is a is <laughs> I think a, 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 an issue that, that continually and annually reappears as a is an issue that people look at and they and, and they try and weigh it up. Each department probably tries to justify it, but it does represent a considerable amount of uh, a revenue within a within a budget. <clears throat> and just for the fact that the personnel, total personnel, as as was mentioned by. Um, City Manager Bohanko, 82%. You don't have a lot to work with. But 
You're in, but you do have the ability to try and control it. I, I, I you know, knowing that the, the contracts are out, you, it's, it's a major task to negotiate the amount of contracts that have to be contended with this year. But hopefully within those contracts, you might be able to control some of the issues that are going to be, that, 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 that reappear and is, it makes up such a large portion of the tax obligation or the spending obligation of the city. You really have a minimal amount of opportunity with 18% left to, to try and whittle away with that. You've got to currently to meet your object, objectives of 3.5%, you've got a $500,000 gorilla on your back. And, you know, hopefully it, it, hopefully you might see it as a six or seven or eight hundred thousand dollar gorilla and maybe just try and achieve a, a, a higher a higher standard of what your 3.5 percent is um, some of the comments here have recognized that I think the economic situations whether it's locally nationally statewide they're starting to they're starting to strain on the pocketbooks of everybody and and I don't know you know what what type of relief is is forthcoming but it is a major factor. It is a consideration when people have to, you know, with the other burdens, the other the other day-to-day -day burdens that, that are whittling away at people's pocketbooks um, still have to be contended with, with the fact that everybody's got to pony up and pay their taxes every year. Um, I don't want to make a lot of comments. I, I think, I, I don't know whether the devil's in the detail. I, I would like to take in and, and have the opportunity to go through the through the budget, you know, the larger budget on a line-by-line line issue and see if there's issues that, that might be addressed later on at a, at a further public hearing. Um, it's curious, I, I wonder on chart 49, and, and I, don't, I know it's, it's, it's uh, stated that property taxes make up 77% of the revenue source for the city. I just was curious where maybe at some time in the future you could kind of, you know, there could be a split to, to, to better understand out of that 77 percent what proportion comes from business, what proportion comes from the citizens and their personal property taxes. I just think it would be an additional piece of information that people could weigh on. We know we have a core population of Portsmouth that's been relatively stable at about 21,000 people. and and. You know, with I don't know how much possibility of growth or other possibilities of new tax revenue sources, but it's still it's a core revenue of people that are, but that that is hopefully better understood of how much are they how much are they burdening the load of this whole of this whole issue and trying to explain what portion of that 77 percent falls on them. Um, I'm not going to go on. Um, I I do kind of take. Note that with some of the department's explanations, especially police and fire, we know we know Pease has been a success story, and I think everyone can recognize that. But also, it has placed, I think, a load onto particular so you know services within the city that have to be contended with. It's part of our part of the city's responsibility, and I know it. I know this tax revenue that's generated from there, but hopefully, but but it's got to be understood that, you know. Um, what, por what portion of the additional services and the increased costs fall within the, I guess, the expansion of that or, or, or within Pease itself? Does it represent, <clears throat> and I don't know, does it represent the possibility of generating more revenue out of that facility to help pay the burden, the tax burdens that, that you know, we're discussing here now? Um, I won't go on. I hope to have the opportunity to look through the larger budget. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. First time speakers. Hi, I'm Helen Steele, 53 Prey Street in Portsmouth. And uh, I don't have an awful lot to say, except I want to voice my great disappointment in the council for not having a zero budget increase, for not requesting that from the departments. And I'm very disappointed in the department heads, who are very well paid men and women, if there are any. Uh, I guess the point is that everyone coming up has something good to say about how they might better spend their money. These department heads are paid a great deal of money for their expertise. 
they should be able to figure out how to, the finances of their department should be uh, taken care of. They should be able to run the departments themselves without putting their hands in the pockets of the taxpayers. This increase will take my taxes from 12000 a year to 12616 I think it's a disgrace that people like Dr. Lister and the rest of the department heads should get the increases in income that they have and continually take it out of the pockets of people who are on Social Security income. I'm really disappointed in all of you. Thank you. Further speakers? Seeing no one rise for the first round, I now call the second round. I've already listed the rules. Everybody knows what they are. We welcome second round speakers. Anyone care to speak? If not, we'll move to the third round and ask people uh, if they wish to come and speak to the budget, please do so. We have a speaker. Uh, I, I guess this is more of a question, and I don't even know if I should be asking a question here, but uh, on the 2.1% budget at the school department, does that include the new salaries? Uh, uh, I shouldn't say that. For the contractual things, or is that just I, – I know that the city manager mentioned. Is that for the entire budget when you mentioned that that was included, that the uh, – I'll just uh, – typically we don't engage in the, in the Q&A in right. this part, but since there's few speakers, uh, the city manager will address that. Is, do you have any other questions before I answer that one? No, no, okay. no. Just okay. That basically, as I described in the chart, there is a line item that we put in regarding uh, contingency for collective bargaining agreement. Uh, for every 1 percent increase in the school departments, uh, if there's a negotiated uh, uh, salary increase, every 1 percent would cost $222,000. We don't know that because it's being negotiated. So uh, the overall city impact every 1 percent, when you look at uh, police, fire, municipal, it's $413,000. One thing I would say is in each department, municipal, uh, police, fire, and school, there are uh, step increases included in that budget. And in the school department, 42 percent of their employees have a step increase coming. So that's reflected in their budget. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Any further speakers for the third time around? Going once. Going twice. And with that, I will not close the public hearing, but rather uh, call it into recess until May 12th at uh, 2008 at 7 o'clock p.m. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. We thank you for coming. So moved. Second. Thank All in you. favor? <laughs> Aye. are in the economic system.